who are visiting with us, just to let you know, after this service, we have Bible classes. We're studying the Gospel of Mark in here. There's also a special ladies class down the hall, and of course, classes for kids of all ages. Wednesday night in our Mark class, we ended with Mark chapter 3 and verse 6, and I'd like to revisit that passage, if you don't mind. So would you turn, please, and look in Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. Mark chapter 3, verse 6. The gospel says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is a significant passage for a couple of reasons. In the first place, up until this point in the Gospel of Mark, the opposition to Jesus has consisted only in skeptical questioning by scribes and Pharisees. But now they have ratcheted up the opposition to the point that they are actually conspiring to destroy him. And the other reason it's a significant passage is because the conspirators are two groups of Jews that normally you would not expect to be working together. One of the groups is the Herodians, about whom we don't know a great deal, except, as you can gather from the name, they are supporters of the regime of King Herod, who in turn was a client of the Roman Empire. The other conspirators are the Pharisees, whose origins come in the time between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, in resistance to pagan influence. So you have on one end of the spectrum a pro-Roman government regime and on the other end of of the spectrum a group of Jews whose history is all about resisting pagans. But here they are working together and what has brought them together is the death of Jesus. Their commitment to putting him to death. What I want you to see this morning is that this is not the only time that enemies of Jesus, who normally would have been at odds with each other, are united by Jesus' death. I'd like for you to follow with me, if you don't mind, through the text of the Gospels to see a couple of more examples. For example, John chapter 11, the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. This is, in the Gospel of John, the seventh of Jesus' miracles that's recorded, obviously the most dramatic. And because of its dramatic impact, the opponents of Jesus realize they have hit a tipping point, which you can read about in John 11 and verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Whenever you see chief priests, you should immediately think Sadducees. That's who the chief priests were. They were aristocrats. They were in charge of the temple. And of course, I've already mentioned the Pharisees. These are competing Jewish factions. They both had membership in the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin Council, which has been convened here according to verse 47. Sometimes these meetings could be very tense. You may recall a story found in Acts. It's in chapter 23 where Paul was called before the Sanhedrin Council and realizing that there were some Pharisees and some Sadducees, he he blurted out, I am a Pharisee on trial for the resurrection of the dead and the hope of Israel. And all of a sudden, they started going back and forth with each other, causing a great clamor that was so violent, the Roman soldiers had to come and whisk Paul away because they were afraid that he was going to be harmed. But there's no clamor here just cold calculation. The mathematics, very simple, according to the high priest. It's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. And so verse 53 says, from that day on they made plans to put him to death. Yet again, Jewish factions, typically at odds with each other, now united by Jesus' death. I'll show you another example of the unifying power of the cross of Christ if you'll turn with me to Luke's gospel, to Luke chapter 23. 
you know that after Jesus' arrest, he had to stand trial before several different authorities, the high priest, the Sanhedrin council, the Roman governor, whose name is Pilate. Luke tells us that after Pilate realized that Jesus is from the part of Israel in the jurisdiction of one of the Herods. He, he would be named Herod Antipas. This is the Herod who had John the Baptist executed. His father, Herod the Great, is the one who had the babies of Bethlehem slaughtered. When Pilate realizes that he's in town for Passover and Jesus is from the part of the territory they controls, he says, ah, I'll send them over here to Herod to cross-examine. So verse eight says, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had long desired to see him because he'd heard about him and was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. As you can see, this Herod cut from the same cloth as his father. But for our purposes this morning, I want you to notice the detail given in verse 12. It says, and Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. We don't know exactly what the cause of this enmity was. If you consult commentaries, they, they will give you various ideas. Here's one thing we do know for sure. Pilate had the reputation of being a brutal, heavy-handed, tone-deaf governor. You can imagine lots of reasons there may have been conflict between him and somebody else like this King Herod. But once again, events associated with the death of Jesus forges two people together who had been at odds. Can I give you one more example of this phenomenon? If you go back with me to the Gospel of John and look with me in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Not only does Jesus' death bring together rival factions of the Jews and not only does it bring together political powers that have been at odds, Notice what happens here in John 19, verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Now, since when were the Jewish people concerned about friendship with Caesar? So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. We have no king but Caesar. What an astonishing claim for these Jewish people to make, especially when you consider that it is quite possible that some of the very same people present here talking about being friends with Caesar and that if you're a, another king, you'll be at enmity with Caesar. Some of these very same people may have been the ones that were fed by Jesus among the 5,000 in John 6. And do you remember what the multitude wanted to do when they were fed by Jesus? They wanted to make him king. That's how much they loved Caesar. That's how much they loved Rome. They were looking for anybody else to be the king. And yet here, the prospect of Jesus' death makes them ignore this impulse to throw off the shackles of the Roman government, which had motivated so much of the, the messianic fever of the first century. Instead, driven by hatred of Jesus, and knowing that they were on the verge of securing from a waffling governor the death sentence. These people profess their loyalty to Caesar as their only king. You remember the story of Samuel when the people are tired of his sons and they demand a king? 
and the prophet expresses his disappointment about rejection. Remember what the Lord said to him? They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them. What did Jesus say? The one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. And now we see here in John chapter 19 that history has repeated itself with the Jewish people professing their loyalty to Caesar as their king. What drove them to pledge such allegiance to Rome? The death of Jesus. Pharisees and Herodians, Pharisees and Sadducees, Pilate and Herod, the Jews and Romans, all finding common ground because of the cross. But here is what is ironic. Sometimes it has been the case that the enemies of Jesus have been more unified by his cross than his followers have been. Like in the case of the Corinthians. In fact, if you'll go with me to chapter 11, which ironically is a chapter often we think about in connection with the Lord's Supper, we will come to see that the Corinthians not only were not united, they were divided, including during the very thing we have come to do right now, which is take the Lord's Supper. Do you remember what Paul says to them before the instructions about the Lord's Supper? In verse 17, he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Some of the Corinthians, those who were well-to-do, were actually using the Lord's Supper as a means to make sure the have-nots understood just how little they had. How bad does it have to be for an apostle to say, you know what, you guys would be better if y'all just didn't even go to church. Just stay home if you're going to act like this. But the problem goes deeper than they're making a mockery of the Lord's Supper, using it for a personal agenda. It's a failure on the part of the Corinthians to understand that in dying for them, Jesus not only intended to make us one with him, but also to make us one with each other. That not only are we united with him, his death is to unite us with each other. That's Paul's point in the previous chapter. Look in chapter 10 and verse 16. Listen to this language. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation, a sharing, a fellowship in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Because we share in Christ, Paul says, we are to be one with each other, and that is supposed to be reflected in our worship together, in our worship at the table together, in the bread and in the cup. But often, that has not happened. Maybe some of you come from churches that over the years have been roiled by division and faction. Oh, there's nothing, hardly worse. Sometimes the followers of Jesus allow personal vendettas to make them separate from others, even in the way they treat them in the assembly. Maybe sometimes those who are well-to-do make sure those who are not so well-to-do understand you're not quite welcome here. Maybe because someone's skin tone was a different color. We all know that there have been times in, in the not-so-distant past 
when people of different races were not welcomed together at the Lord's table in many congregations claiming to be churches of Christ. And I don't say this from any self-righteousness. I'm convinced that if I lived in other times, whatever prejudices were common in that day, I would undoubtedly have held as well. But I do think it's good to remind ourselves from time to time that that sort of thing has happened in the past and that it should not have happened because there's not one Jesus for white people and another for black people and another for Hispanic people and another for Asian people. There's not a white-collar Jesus and a blue-collar Jesus. There's not a well-educated Jesus and an uneducated Jesus. There is one Jesus who gave one body, who created one body, and he did all of that through one cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says this in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized in one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of the same spirit. I look around the room today and I see people of different races, different ethnicities, lots of different family trees. But according to scripture, there is one heritage that we all have. Paul says in Ephesians 2, we are children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's who we are. And socially, I look around the room and I see people on different economic strata and different kinds of jobs and different occupations. But in terms of our standing before Jesus, all of us are slaves of sin and utterly spiritually bankrupt. We've all had the same desperate need. We all need the same gracious Savior. We are added to the same spiritual body, and we today are coming together to eat the same bread and drink of the same cup. And I would just say that if the death of Christ could bring Jewish parties together and political leaders who hated Jesus together, and Jews and Romans together, if the death of Jesus could have such a unifying impact on his enemies, then above all else, the cross of Jesus Christ should unite those of us who have embraced Jesus, placed our trust in him, and been immersed into his death and his resurrection. And so as the song we are about to sing says, through the loving son, the Father made us one. Come, take the bread. Come, drink the cup. And let us come and share the Lord. When we get to the last phrase, we're going to repeat it. <clears throat> 